good evening one and all give me a minute to actually pull up this chair the right way and let's see how things are looking on the camera not too bad welcome back to another evening of miniature painting with the coffee baron <laughs> how is everyone doing tonight let's see what did i miss in the chat while i have that going smooth jazz is going to put you to sleep well that is kind of the point of the stream is either to help out the insomniacs who happen to be up this late at night on a regular basis if you happen to be on the east coast and so on and so forth or if you're somewhere like i am on the west coast to give you a little bit of something to calm down with and put yourself to sleep i am having a hard time staying awake at the moment so my drink of choice for the evening is uh well coffee <laughs> hmm. audio is a little low let me uh let's see here Okay, I moved the microphone a little bit closer. Let me know how that sounds, and uh, if I need to, I can adjust audio levels. It's better, but is it good enough? Good morning from Ukraine. My gosh, my friend, what are you doing in Ukraine? Do you happen to be Ukrainian? Oh, and thank you for the sub, Night Owl. 309 gift subs in the channel. My dude, you are too kind to us. And, well, I suppose too kind to our, <laughs> to the rest of the fan base. Okay. Well, that'll work all right. If you guys would prefer to have uh, my audio levels a little bit higher, just let me know. Oh, evening, TK. Hmm. I've been working on using my Bialetti mocha pot recently, trying to get all the kinks worked out insofar as getting the uh, getting my own personal preference down with it as far as coffee making goes. Usually doing that and then a little bit of uh, a little bit of chocolate milk powder added in helps out a little bit. <laughs> You're trying to stay at 308. Yeah. <laughs> Funny meme number. Just keep on going until you get up to 420. Then you'll be at the next meme number. Easy. Huh. Let me see here. Take you over here and you over here. Well, all right. Now that we're all in. Ooh, got you a mocha pot. It's the giant ones that makes like three cups at once. Yeah, mine is an oddball one that is like um, slightly too small to make like two full cups of coffee, but not quite enough to, uh, it, but not quite too small to only make one cup of coffee at a time. So I always wind up with just like a little bit of excess left over. And so I just stick that. Um, stick the mocha pot itself in the fridge or something like that and then the next day i come in i've got like half a cup of cold coffee that i can just if i need a little if i want a little bit of coffee when i get off work something nice and easy or something like this where i just uh give myself a little bit of a perk for the evening um it's right there sitting and waiting for me get this tilted down a little bit because i don't think i think that'll be a little bit more direct once i'm actually into the painting okay Nothing like learning coffee tech while driving around your Rifleman 2C. <laughs> well, they put coffee holders in those things for a reason, don't you know? Didn't you see the, uh, what was that animation? Hired Steel? The one that texted the uh, voice for the Merc Commander in. I really liked his coffee mug. Nice coasters. Yeah, thank Eldonius Rex for those coasters. He does some wonderful work on all kinds of things. I also recently put um, several of his uh, stickers onto my uh, water bottle as well. Got the uh, Canopus Cat House, got the Knife Fight City, got the Paladin uh, Mercenary Company. Probably doesn't show up all that well because it's too, too uh, holographic, but whatever. Oh yeah, no, it's an uh, 
Hired Steel is an excellent animation. It There isn't much of it so far, but as, as far as I'm aware, they're still just kind of like continually um, slowly putting more out over time. But Anyways, as I said before, if my audio levels need a tweak at any point, just let me know, or if anything else goes funky with the stream. For the time being, I think it's time for me to pick up a brush and... Uh, get started on something but what I'm gonna get started on is the question that I now have to ask both myself and I suppose you guys I haven't uh, I never did sit down and uh, figure out how to start a poll on here and frankly I don't think there's enough people that a poll is really gonna get me a whole lot but as far as the miniatures that I have that are ready and willing to be painted last time that we were here I was painting oh let me, uh, let me see how this looks when I actually bring one up there check my uh, exposure and whatnot um, oh, I'm getting to hit the focus also so let me tick up the exposure just a bit nope. uh, yeah and let me hit the focus the right way Okay, that should be a little bit better. That exposure is probably pretty all right because I can always, if I need more light, just bring it in there. But okay, so I think we're good on that. So last time we were painting, I was working on these lovely miniatures from Res Tatica that feature. Uh, women and men from uh, derived from, I think it was 1400s, 1500s is what we were talking about last time, uh, Italian fencing treaties. Um, like the poses are ripped straight out of some of the diagrams. I believe they were Achille Morazzo's. But I've been painting these for uh, Mordheim, and I have been enjoying the heck out of them. So I've got those. I have the uh, Mordheim intended undead zo and zombies that I was working on previously examples of which I've got here the madam and the uh, butcher I have several more two more zombies I think before I get into doing the uh, the vampire the necromancer and so on and so forth I've also got some ultra modern minis some Bundeswehr from I believe Empress miniatures some modern Germans with the uh, gladius system And then outside of that, I still have some skeletons that need a little bit more metallic work done on them from the Cursed City box. I do have some Clan Novacat mechs that I have been slowly adding. Um, I was doing their Alpha Galaxy pattern on them and trying to, uh, like I, I got images from the Hubble Space Telescope and was trying to somewhat mimic them on the uh, paint schemes for them in the star area. Uh, besides that, the only other things I've got right here on the table were um, some Death Corps of Krieg Heavy Flamer teams, which I am was not having the greatest time with last time I was doing them because I was trying to do a uh, trying to do their uh, coats like their um, very glossy leather. So I made them gloss with the intent of just painting using the shine off of the camera or off of the uh, lamp as the uh, pattern for the. Uh, where the light hits it, but I never got around to uh, doing that fully, just because it was I couldn't really get down whatever color I wanted to use. So, if you have any preference as to what you'd like to see me paint tonight, just let me know. If not, I'll pick something in just a moment. Yeah. Stompy Robot is always a solid choice, especially when we're on the BPL. If I do want to do that, I need to go grab the reference images, which will just take me about 30 seconds to go out and do the um, um, 
go ahead and grab the binder off the top of my thing. Like the skelly mins, but that's my opinion. Stop your robot down for whatever. Skelly min is always a, a, a solid choice. It doesn't have to be ha Halloween to enjoy the spooky, scary skeletons. I know that feel I have this big Draco Lich I haven't painted and I haven't quite nailed the color I want. Yeah, sometimes that gets me where I'll just be painting along and just going and going and going. Then I'll get to a certain spot and I just go, hmm, I, uh, I didn't plan this out and I don't know what I want to do with this now. <laughs> I get that uh, most, you know, most professional painters that I've heard talk about it often... Um, Mentioned that they usually start and go into things with a paint plan. Like they sit down and seriously go into reference images and writing down the whole list of exactly what and where they want to do things and then just go about it that way. That way there's never a point where you can't stop and go, what was I supposed to be doing? And be able to look at a list and go, oh, yeah, exactly. That's the step that I want to do now. But I tend not to do that as much just because I frankly don't feel like it. <laughs> Um, usually it works out pretty okay, but sometimes I get tripped up on occasion. Yeah, there is never a season in which you can't get spooked. This is true. This is very, very true. All seasons are spooky, scary seasons if you try hard enough. Yeah, I've done it. So I have done the uh, paint planning thing on occasion when there has been something like a large project um, that I want to do over a long period of time army-wise because at least then when I start getting to the, um, the point where I just kind of drag a little bit and go like, I don't know what I want to do next, then there's always just that to kind of like fall back on and go, well, the next step is just grab this paint and do that thing. Um, very rarely do I do that, but I also like to bounce back and forth between projects so much. I play spooky, scary skeletons on bass well, until my wife starts humming at this time. <laughs> oh my god, that is evil. That is downright evil, and I love it. I need to learn how to play that on piano now so I can do the exact same thing to my partner. And that will really get her. That will really get her because she's starting to learn how to play piano herself also. So it'll get stuck in her head and then she's much better than I am at um, playing by ear. So I'll, I'll bet that I could get her to, if I do that enough, I could probably get her to start just plinking it out on the piano and then she won't be able to stop herself. <laughs> That's awesome. No, that's not an awesome. That's skeletons. <laughs> Dad joke. Let me just reach. And... That's not an awesome. This is an awesome. <laughs> nice try, bud. Okay. All right, so let me grab these skeletons then and take a look at what I actually do need to do with them. Because it's been quite a while. I think I had gotten them pretty much finished. The main thing was I was fucking around learning how to use um, the uh, AK Interactive's Rust products, the Rust Streaks and the um, Light Rust, which are essentially just enamel washes, like oil wash in a bottle. Um and I wasn't sure exactly like how heavily rusted I wanted them. So is that a Knights of the Inner Sphere paint job? My dude, my guy, that is a Knights of the Inner Sphere paint job. Or at least it was the start of one. I was testing out a couple of different products at that time. And since I was doing those, I found 
uh, my preferred method of painting golds, which is essentially mixing my own gold by taking... Um, this is uh, Green Stuff World's Pure Metal uh, Pigments. It's actually just like a gold metal pigment, so it's just a powder on the inside. I just take... Uh, Vallejo Metal Color uh, has a, um, they call it a metal varnish, but it's just an extremely glossy varnish, and I mix that with that powder, and boom, it makes a great gold. Lord Grima subscribed at Tier 1. Oh, greetings, fellow painter. Thank you for coming in, and thank you for subscribing. Tonight, I believe I'll be painting a handful of spooky, scary skeletons from the uh, Warhammer Cursed City box case in point here's one of the uh here's the sergeant looking dude let me get a little more light on him there we go i really like the way that these guys look how they all came out yeah skeleton yeah <laughs> yeah i like the purple too um I wanted something that would kind of like wouldn't be too warm and too lifelike and lively, but would definitely pop against all of the very dingy and rusted metal. Um, and I like the idea that these guys are some sort of like, I think they're supposed to just be town guard, frankly, but they've got a regimental look that makes them look like they could have been some sort of royal guard or something. So uh, purple being the color of royalty. And I just absolutely love purple. Half the reason why I chose to call this thing inksomnia was because of the uh this is my personal favorite ink of all time and i use it in almost every project i do dollar rowney fw purple lake it's good stuff man painted two mechs in a different scheme from the others i tried and i'm pretty happy with them nice have you uh submitted them to the uh um oh gosh what was it uh I can't remember what the email was off the top of my head, but there is an email for the BPL for uh, user submissions. I'll have to, um, hopefully someone pops in here. There it is. Art at WBPL76.com. Yes. Perfect. I haven't sat down with anybody recently. I've been very, very busy the last couple of weeks. Um, so I haven't had a chance to sit down with some of the people who could teach me how to do some of the more advanced things as far as like just being able to bring up like a slideshow of other people's work and so on and so forth um but uh once i do i would love to start going through some of the submissions also the same sort of way that parallax does i picked up dw velvet violet it really makes purple pop yeah inks have a really good um as long as you control them decently well and, you, and they don't just completely overpower whatever you're putting them on, they've got a really good ability to take something and just make it pop. Just add just make add that little juicy element to it that wasn't there before. Oh, hey, Orc Slayers. Welcome back. How's your evening going so far? Ah. Uh. Okay. So... I think basically all I needed to do with these guys, or at least all I wanted to do with them as far as just getting them majority finished, was I had already gone back and I had done them in rust, and then I had applied the silver back over the top for the highlighting, but then decided I wanted them more rusty. So I went back over with more of the light rust, and I think I wiped most all of it off and got them... Yeah, I did. Um... So what I need to do now is, um, I think I hadn't done the rust streaks to get some of the darker brown uh, put into it. So I might do that and kind of dry brush that on really quick before I go back again with the, um, with the silver metallic once more and uh, apply highlights and make the silver look like it's not rusted um, like the rest of it. I messed up my Orion when I got home from a gig, and I didn't notice that the black came out a sort of purple, not black. I'm colorblind and didn't notice that it had settled out weirdly. Oh, that is kind of interesting. Um, I have run into that sometimes with uh, certain paint lines where even things that you would think are simple colors, like black, are many different pigments mixed together. So um, it could be something like it was it settled in the bottle and it didn't get mixed enough or it didn't um 
uh, in the application process, it like you said, it settled weirdly and had separated out sort of, so it came out looking more purple or something. I don't know. Hey.exe, I've been modding New Vegas and just ordered the Cyberpunk 2020 Night City Sourcebook. Not bad. I've been thinking about playing New Vegas again recently, but that's just one of those like, oh god, I want to play it, but I really want to play it heavily modded, and I don't know if I want to put the effort into modding it <laughs> at the moment. Okay, so I'm going to need the Rust Streaks. That means that I'm going to be using enamel, so I need to move my water out of the way so I don't put the thing into it. Um, I'm going to need an enamel brush and some mineral spirits, which I think I have on my other table. Let me go get it. Oh, no, I, I know it's really easy to mod. It's just the, the matter of figuring out, like, there's a lot of mods that I really like that are old and never got really updated, like Impact and similar things. So a lot of the times I will um, just kind of accept that I'm going to be adding mods that kind of sort of break the game. So it's a matter of figuring out what I can and can't get to work together without... Um, and also like how much I can stuff into it before I start tipping the engine past its breaking point as far as like just forcing it to generate too much all at once. Not like too many objects, but just like way overdone textures, way overdone effects, way overdone character models, and so on and so forth. I like the Winter Mute mod for Skyrim. Sadly, it just broke with no way to fix it until the creator gets around to it. I don't remember if I looked at that before. Is that a visual mod uh, for Skyrim? What hit you? Or, or is that like a total overhaul? Or something similar? One second, let me grab the uh, uh, mineral spirits and the brush I need. Wait, wasn't Wintermute a... Uh, that's a Neuromancer reference, right? It's been so long since I read Neuromancer. Oh, uh... Do you mean... So do you mean the uh, Winterfall? Or not, not Winterfall, uh, Frostfall? Or is that like a spiritual successor to Frostfall? Oh, hey Bowser. Welcome in. I'm going to need new brushes. Diggs got hungry. Yeah, I know. I could show you. Let me just show you what Diggs did to my last brush, all right? One second. Look at this. Look. It used to be like this. Don't let Diggs near your brushes, people. This is what he does. Sometimes he just gets a little bit hungry and he just needs that, you know, just needs that synthetic golden tackle on hair. Hmm. Frankly, I don't even remember what I did with that brush. <laughs> I think I left that, like, sitting in some mineral spirits or something like that, and it dissolved the, um, it dissolved the, uh, what do you call it? The adhesive inside of it. It's nervous chewing sometimes, yeah. Makes him safe like Smokey the Bear. Uh, oh, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Significantly less likely for you to, uh, for those to catch fire once he's done with them. Although I guess I think the inside is still made out of wood, but at least without those little hairs on it, you're not so likely to uh, have it spontaneously combust when there's just like an ember nearby. Shit. Um, let's see. Did I put any clean things in here or do i need to just go wash all of these ah here we go let's see if i've got any other rusted ones in here 
No, nope, these are all just various metals. Okay. So now that I've got that. Frankly, I don't even know if I'm going to need that or not, but we'll find out. Back to lurking. Yeah. Speaking of lurking, thanks to the uh, Streamlabs uh, popping up, I keep on remembering that. If you haven't seen it before, the Legion now has an auxiliary Discord. Let me uh, pop that up in the chat. If you haven't seen it before and you'd like to join, the Auxiliary Discord is free to join. <laughs> Sorry about that, Mad Ducks. I'm the fastest brush in the West. Or something. Okay. Get a little bit of that mineral spirit there. <clears throat> All right, I'm just going to lay a small amount of this into the uh, little pallet cup thing that I've got here because I want it to dry out a little bit um, so that it will kind of uh, more dry brush on than anything, more kind of chalk on. In the meantime, I'm going to wipe the heck out of this brush to get it a little bit more. It's not going to really dry brush on, but it'll go on kind of like more like applying the pigment as opposed to... Uh, as opposed to like brushing it on like I did with the other thing. I don't want it to flow into the cracks and whatnot. I want to try and get the higher points. So let me see. Where's the focus right now? Okay, it's pretty high. So I'll just make sure to keep this up here decently high. How does the focus look to you folks? Okay, all I'm doing is, like I said, not really any particular, uh, really no particular method to this. All I'm trying to do is just add a little bit of color, uh, color variety into here. Just kind of put it wherever the, uh, wherever that light orange is, I'm taking some of this darker brown and kind of like, this just dulls it down so it doesn't make it look like the whole thing is just orange. I haven't uh, recently looked at and studied weathering, so I don't really know what realistically rust is supposed to do as far as the brown streaks goes. But either way, I'm just trying to kind of add a little tonal variety and tone down that orangeness. Focus looks good. Okay, I'll keep on trucking. Coffee, I am returned. Welcome back, Mazke. You haven't missed a whole ton of much on this stream yet, my friend. All I've been doing is just... Just barely started plugging away at these skellies. Spooky, scary skeletons. Just adding a little bit of darker brown rust streaks into the areas where I've already put the uh, rust. And uh, after that, I'll be adding back in some metallic highlights. Yeah, that's looking better. 
Ooh, a bit much there, but that's okay. That's okay. And now I have my very own plastic crack in the form of a Battletech starter set. I have about half the mechs from Hired Steel. Nice. Is that the uh, is that starter set the uh, oh and a Battlemaster? So you got the not the beginner box, but the the standard like game of armored combat box. For my money, that is the uh, best deal for a starter set for any war game in the business right now. Predominantly just because it's so cheap and, uh, yeah, Akawak. Agauk? Agauk. Um, a game of armor combat. Yeah, it, uh, there are other boxes that I think that are, for one, cheaper and better as far as just, like, uh, starting rules-wise. But, like, for the price, there's no other game out there at that price point, um, war game wise that provides you with two uh full basically the equivalent of like two full armies like you've got two full lances that's the standard um that's like it, you could go anywhere in the world and get a pickup game of battle tech and it's expected you would bring one lance so you come with that you come with the core rule book with the full rules to play the game as you need to without the all the optional rules and quite a few extra supplements and map sheets which is the equivalent of getting like a pack of terrain in uh and something else. Ooh, one of my candles is leaking a bit. Well, that's okay. It's just going to harden and turn into candle wax. <laughs> no paints, though. I need to find the right colors, find them in the right sheen, matte, matte gloss, and gloss, or what have you. Brushes and a cutting board like yours. The cutting board is never necessary if you just have some cardboard lying around or something similar. Or, frankly, um, I have... Uh, if you just go to like a hardware store and you go to the painting section, you can get drop cloths, which are just like the canvas cloths that you see painters put down. If you just double fold those up and put them on the, uh, put them over the top of your table, boom, there you go. You have a canvas surface made for the purpose of having paint dropped on it. So that's always an option. These are very nice though. I will say I do like them. Uh, and I have always had one at my, um, painting desk. They're just, uh, they're convenient because they are cutting mats, so you can cut things on them, you can measure things on them, which is very useful. And they provide a very nice uniform surface that lets you um, see most everything that's on it and does a very good job of protecting from most anything. So they work very well. Okay, let's go. This guy may have had some applied to it already, but that's okay. Same sort of thing. Just gonna try to hit all the spots where it doesn't, where the rust wouldn't have collected as deeply, leaving the orange in the uh, deeper recesses, but kind of helping clear up a lot of the areas where there's just too much orange as it is dulling it down a little bit. I also need some dummy pieces to paint for practice. Well, my friend, let me give you some advice that will piss off a handful of uh, painters that I know. Uh, Army men, if you have a dollar store nearby, uh, they probably have some sort of army men or something similar. Um, they are very useful for testing like paint products and things out on to figure out like is this matte is this shiny um as well as uh giving you a chance to practice a handful of basic um basic techniques on something to kind of get get to grips with what it feels like and like oh i need to take off more paint when i'm dry brushing before i start to actually put the brush on the miniature and whatnot that way you have a ready access to something that are very, very cheap with some texture on them. Yeah, WizKids Miniatures also. That's uh, that as well as a good place.
uh, yeah, WizKids miniatures and Reaper Bones are two of the uh, more well-known, um, like, uh, what do you want to say? Bargain? Bargain, yeah. Two of the more well-known kind of like bargain miniature paint, miniature brands um, that make good quality miniatures that you can get for like a dollar or two each sometimes. Um, the WizKids ones, if you get them in stores, they're typically like $5 for a pack of one or two models depending on the size but um the real nice thing with the whiz kids ones is they also offer large models um like their pricing model follows for a lot of other things so if you see a really badass looking dragon model and you go i want to paint that sometime but it's like 200 dollars, and you go i don't want to paint that until i practice on something else first whiz kids has got your back and uh you can go get like a, a nice size dragon model for like 30 bucks from WizKids, if not cheaper, which would normally be like from Games Workshop closer to like a hundred something dollars at this point, <laughs> frankly, for the size of the WizKids ones. So it's nice to have something like that where you just always have an option for a bargain bin alternative to... Um, to uh, every other brand, essentially. So you can try things out and test stuff, test products, test techniques, whatnot, without uh, without any restraint, because you know that you can always just get another one of them for very cheap if you want to do it again. I use my field resin prints. My supply is endless, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. I know that feeling. I haven't printed anything in resin in a while, but when I do go back to printing in resin, I am definitely going to be saving all of the uh, supports to make some uh, Warcry terrain, some very hellish-looking spike terrain. Try to make it look like something out of Brutal Legend. Let's see. Uh... Righto. Do you recommend gloss paints for stuff like laser and PPC diodes? So um, you can. You can use regular gloss paints. Uh, my personal recommendation usually for things that you want to look like lenses quickly and easily is... Um, here, let me get this paint off my brush really quick. There's a, If you go look on the internet at Tamiya, uh, Tamiya has a set of clear paints that are transparent but extremely high gloss. They're used most commonly by people like painting cars who need to get like a candy apple color you know have you ever, you ever seen a car that's like candy apple red well to me a um, clear red will give you that result when you airbrush it or when you lay it on by hand i use that for all of my um death core of krieg uh their gas mask eye lenses and their um gas mask eye lenses and their little respirator box things have some uh, glass in them and so I paint that all green but I've got several different colors um, outside of that uh, for laser and PPC diodes you also might look at um, uh, some people use the same or similar technique to cockpit jeweling or just jeweling in general if you look up how to if you go to YouTube and you look up tutorials on how to paint jewels um, most commonly you'll find uh, tutorials on how to paint um, whatever they're called, soul stones or whatever the Eldar, um, whatever the things are that the Eldar have in Warhammer 40k that traps their soul when they die. A lot of people watch um, or make tutorial videos on how to uh, paint those to make them look like actual jewels, which just so happens to also be what um, colored glass lenses tend to look like when you paint them. So you can do that if you want to. This is um, this is to me a clear red. So this is just one of they've got clear red, they've got clear green, blue, yellow, orange. They've got a clear black called smoke. Um, but most of them, when you look at them, X twenty seven, X twenty four, X twenty, it's usually all in the X twenty range, um, and it'll say clear whatever. So clear red or clear green or whatever. And uh, I don't know if this will show up much on camera, but like when you look at it, you can see how it coats the inside of the glass and makes the glass look like it's transparent red. So um, people also often use this mixed with uh, Yoohoo glue and a little bit of black ink, and they uh, use it for blood effects. 
but um, it uh, it comes out extremely good. You can so yes, you can paint it over a metallic or any other colors. It will have a much better sheen when you paint it over a metallic. Let me actually just if you give me one second, I will go grab a miniature that I've been using them extensively on and show you kind of what they come out looking like. Okay, I'm back. So here's a couple of examples really quick of what the Tamiya paints will do over various different things. So this is all stuff from Adeptus Titanicus. Um, this is the clear red and the clear green sprayed on top of... Um, let's see if I can get that to show. Sprayed on top of uh, the reds I did on top of a silver metallic. Everything that's the green I did on top of... Um, gold leafing actually so get the focus i don't know if this is going to really show up on camera just by nature of how shiny this is it's probably just going to look pretty damn glossy but uh, the red really shows up pretty good let me get something that's a little bit less this is more just the straight the green sprayed on top of metallic uh let me just kick up the exposure that might help a little bit Sorry about that. That might have blasted you a little bit. But if I do that, maybe when I pull this away, it'll be less shiny, but show it a little bit better. No, still not so much. Well, anyways, um, and then there's the uh, legs from a Warbringer Nemesis Titan. It's the same thing. The greens I did over top of a... Um, greens I did over top of uh, gold leafing, and then the reds are... Uh, straight over a silver with the exception of the kneecaps I also did over gold leafing so yeah I know uh, maybe if I bring it up higher that's a little bit better but still comes up very dark anyways those are just a handful of things I've been doing yeah Christmas Mechanicus uh, so not actual gold leaf but it's like a it's applied in the same method I guess some of it was actual gold leaf but the gold leaf that you can get at um, like an art store like Michael's or Hobby Lobby. And I also found out like most of what I used on these actually was um, nail polish, not nail polish, but like for doing nails, they also make uh, flake, which acts exactly the same way and is applied in the same way as um, gold leaf flake. So uh, yeah, I know. Uh, I think the copper and the gold that I got initially uh, that was like crumpled uh, flake leaf was actual gold and copper, just extremely low quality. So it's not super cheap, but it's not particularly expensive. I want to say it was like 20 something dollars for a couple of sheets of it. But you got to understand these sheets are like hair thin. They crumple as soon as you touch them practically. Um so when when professionals do it you actually see them like they keep it inside like the housing sort of thing and they like gently lift open the flap on the housing and they slap it on kind of or just like wipe it on practically this stuff was um flake that you apply the adhesive and then you just like sprinkle the flake all over it and then you take something like a um I used a stencil brush which is one of the ones that's like cut flat but you can take just any large flat brush and uh, you just kind of swirl the brush around on it and it pushes the leaf down. Anyways, the point of me showing this was just to kind of give you an idea of, yeah, this is what the this is what the Tamiya uh, clear coat does, where it's like it gives you the effect of practically looking like it's colored glass, which when you're talking about um, laser and PPC diodes, that's a good way to go about it if you want something quick. But you can get much more dynamic and interesting looking results if you actually look how to um, paint jewel effects yourself, which for the most part, as I understand it, are fairly simple. I think it's basically just like if you've got a circle, 
you would paint the circle a dark color, like very dark blue. And then you do like a slightly lighter blue in a kind of semicircle up on the top part. And then a, a even lighter blue on a semicircle on the bottom part. And then you put a dot of like an off white color on there and it, um, that boom, you got a, a lens of some sort. So let's see. What have I missed in chat? I'm back to wash dishes. Well, you enjoy your time washing dishes, friend. Come on back if you want to hear me uh, ramble a little bit more. Um, now I'm going to base coat him and give him some battle damage. Ooh, nice Warhound. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've been using Citadel Technical Paints for the same effect. Super gloopy out of the pot. I'll have to give them a try. These are also extremely gloopy out of the pot. If you're applying them, if you apply the Tumia paints by with brush um, rather than with airbrush, you kind of have to like lay it on there. You don't paint it on. Very prone to getting paint streaks if you like actually push it around. So what I do is kind of just like it's almost like a repetitive tapping motion to get it to adhere. And you just keep on doing that over and over, further and further from the initial point until you filled the area, area, and then you just let it sit. And then it self levels, and that's part of what um, that's part of what gives you that kind of glass effect. Is once it settles, it forms a very, very smooth uh, finish. But um, the uh, airbrush is the the way that I get the the effects that I was showing you here. Um, it's a lot thinner through the airbrush, but still comes out with the same sort of effect. Um, you are, if you try to use too much of it all at once on anything besides like a, an open surface without too many details, if you're doing it with a brush, you are liable, I would think, to potentially fill detail. But most of the time, it's one of those things of like, why, like, what are you painting um that you what are you painting that's extremely detailed and sort of like a cloth or fur or um otherwise like textured form that you need this sort of paint on uh 99 of the time when you're painting anything with this it's because you want it to look like glass and typically glass looks like uh well a, a nice flat surface so i can totally see some people going for like a um Toying around with like the uh, the terracotta army, but uh, making them like a glass army instead, that would be kind of neat. But that would be a lot of effort. Um, nothing like winding down to good rambles and paint advice while trying to patch together a sleeve on a tiny coat. Nice. Uh, Morgan Baller, have you tried those Vallejo shifting paints? I picked some up today. Not totally sold on them yet. No, I have not. Um, I'm not super keen on the whole shifting paint thing. I have never been a huge fan of it, even in like cars and stuff like that um but part of it is just that i can't think of anything in my collection i would want to use them on and i'm probably not the target audience for that i could possibly use them maybe on like the nova cat mechs that i have like i would use them if i had miniatures to do this for i would love to use them to make like a dot pattern fish scale effect on something or if i were playing an army like Zinch or Seraphon or something similar where it's like way crazy ridiculous um, either reptilian or uh, like just way out there wizardy sort of stuff then I would but like in 40k I play Imperial Guard <laughs> in uh, Mordheim I play Undead in Warhammer Fantasy I play Vampire Counts and I don't typically have a ton of magic casters um i'm just i'm playing urukai and lord of the rings there's not a whole lot of call for me to use that in something like titanicus or like BattleTech, except for various few specific things i don't really have any miniature sets that i would want to use them on but if i did i would probably use them a lot more I'm not saying that they're bad by any means just that like i'm i'm the wrong uh, target audience because most of my stuff is pretty grounded Got into good paints for a sandy khaki tan, a slightly sandy olive green, and a slightly bright maroon, and a mid-sky blue. Those will probably be in matte, going on top of whatever base layer I put on the mechs, if anything. Well, um, one thing, uh, so Vallejo, if you, if I don't remember if you, you had said that you got some of them or not, but like Vallejo is one of those kind of brands that, when you look at the Vallejo or Vallejo uh, model color range, they have 
hundreds of colors, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. And most of them are a vaguely matte to satin sort of color. But most of them, typically you're going to wind up, um, with a few exceptions, when you're first starting painting, you should expect that your the finish on something should be controlled by your varnish um, that you put at the end rather than the paints that you use. Most professional painters, when you get deeper into it, especially when you get really deep into it, they all paint with hyper matte. They don't all paint with hyper matte paints, but like the expectation is everything that they paint is going to be matte because they don't tend to use things that reflect light because they want to manually control light placement on their miniature and not have light bouncing. Um, but typically, at least when you're beginning, I would say that your expectation should be you just get whatever colors work best for you. And when you want them to be matte, expect that you need to uh mat them at the um with a matte varnish or something similar and same with satin and gloss and whatnot if there are parts that you want glossy paint everything else in the matte or um paint everything in the normal colors and then apply a gloss varnish on top of it at the end or something similar um as far as paint lines that have those most every paint line will probably have all of those sort of things uh those all sound like pretty grounded colors so like i said vallejo metal color like if i just grab like directly right here i actually just have if i just grab like this first layer of paints that i have right here right in the same spot these all basically have the colors that you're talking about in several different shades so like let me just shake these really quick just to get them mixed a little uh you want a sandy khaki tan well here's iraqi sand um and outside of that, if you wanted like a slightly sandy olive green, you've got middle stone uh, or uh, stone gray, possibly. Uh, let me turn the exposure down now that I'm not uh, fucking around with the Titanicus models. There we go. So like just out of these, these five were all just right next to each other and those are like there's a decent selection of exactly the kinds of colors you're probably looking for um and then same thing with the other ones a slightly bright maroon totally they'll have something like that uh, a mid sky blue totally they'll have something like that um i would just say look through the model color range online um like you can find if you can find a distributor that sells them uh then you could look through their um you could look through their website at all the different colors they have, and usually they'll show little swatches online of what their uh, of what the colors kind of look like. Yeah, Vallejo or Vallejo, Acrylicos Vallejo. There's the uh, the brand you can kind of see right there on the bottom. Yep. Um, that's usually my recommendation for a go-to when you're getting started because uh, Vallejo paints will perform like everyone says paints are supposed to perform i run into that quite commonly with other paint ranges where it's like i'll be following a tutorial video and going man i feel like i'm doing what this guy is doing but it's not coming out the same and then i had one of my friends show me how to do it and, and come to find out he once he used the paint he was like oh god this is just this paint just doesn't do that in this particular line but vallejo is one of the ones that like their whole line is pretty consistent oh that's right it's mirrored i'm sorry um, but yeah, their whole line is pretty consistent and they have a very, very large selection of paints and they are very cheap relative to everyone else in the industry. So, um, they're kind of just like the perfect middle ground. They don't do any one thing like perfectly amazing compared to like most other paint ranges have an extremely strong point to them in some way, but lack in other ways vallejo is n not one of those they're, they're the ones that where it's just like it's right in the middle and so it'll give you a perfect baseline to then like every time that i pick up a new paint range i almost always in my head uh go back to like okay this feels like vallejo but with these differences and i get a new paint line going okay this feels like vallejo but with these differences comparatively whereas i don't like i i don't do the apples to oranges thing with regards to like um i'm not going to compare war colors and uh turbo dorks metallics or something like that because that's not they're not the same um 
or, or like the Vallejo metal colors. I'm not going to compare those to like scale 75's metal colors because they're just not the same sort of formulation. They don't have the same medium and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, exactly. So the Warhammer 6R, good enough is perfect. You're correct on that, Mas guy. Um, are you, I can't remember, are you US based or are you somewhere else? Because if you're US based, I can recommend places to look at online for um, where to buy them at and where to kind of examine their lines. But, well, I guess I can just say it anyways. If you are United States based, there is a website called uh, Scale Hobbyist. I believe it's scalehobbyist.com. Um, they are, you can buy Vallejo paints from them individually as well as plenty of different paint sets. And their shipping rates are extremely reasonable, and their prices for Vallejo paints are also extremely reasonable. Some of the cheapest out there as far as distributor goes. Um, Vallejo has had some supply issues since COVID, so at least getting to the United States. So there may be some things that they don't have access to. But you could go onto their website, um, and you could totally go onto the Scale Hobbyist website and take a look around because I think that they have it set to where it's like you can see swatches of every color, which almost never perfectly match what the paint actually is, but it's close enough that it shouldn't really matter in the painting process. Um, often they do have pictures of the actual paint uh, bottle, though. So there you go. Uh, let me get these Titanicus models off the table really quick, and I'll get back to uh, doing the painting on the skeletons. Okay, I return. What else did I miss when I was rambling? Um, the Lamier on mine. Oh God, I haven't. <laughs> I haven't. Uh, my Celtic is rusty. I'm sorry, Gaelic. I mean, and or Irish. I can't tell the difference <laughs> when I'm reading it. Um, yeah, I picked up a box for shits and giggles. Not sure if I buy, will buy the other two sets. Yeah, if you if you get some use out of those Vallejo shifting paints, definitely I would say pick up uh, whatever else you think you need. But it's just one of those sort of things. Like I said, I like them, uh, or I like the concept of them on certain very specific things. But I don't know when I would ever use them on any models I have right now or that I'm planning on doing. It means one handed king base coat done. Time for details layer work. Not bad. I. Uh, I recently have been having fun with Titanicus. Here, let me get some water really quick. Mm. Ah, excellent hydration. Um, I've been having fun with Titanicus recently because my friends have been uh, all been painting Titanicus stuff also, and everybody is getting into the um, really digging into and enjoying the naming process for them, where you just come up with phrases translate them into latin on uh using google translate and then bastardize it to make it sound like uh to make it sound like high gothic which is you know latin but completely incorrect um i've been having a really really fun time with that because i my force that i'm playing is legio solaria so they're supposed to be the imperial hunters or specifically the imperial huntresses prior to Beta Garmin, uh, or the Battle of Beta Garmin, the Battle of Titan Death, when they were practically annihilated, uh, they were an all-female uh, Legio tank bred. Um, and they had a huge thing for hunting and sport and so on and so forth. So I've been enjoying... They, they really like Warhound uh, Titans, along with other smaller patterns. Um and most of the rules focus around him, so I've been having fun translating various different forms of uh, dog jokes or just dog names into pseudo-pig Latin for high gothic. Not pig Latin, but just pseudo-Latin for high gothic. Hail hydrate, yes. Have you been drinking enough water? We will check. We will find out, and we will urge you to drink more. So 
I couldn't tell you how much that vid on the Warhammer helped me convince a friend that the space engineer's design were perfectly fine being robust, blocky things that they are. Very rarely have needed to modify them for any reason, rarely needed to replace them. Tanks is my man for any machine you could need. Good guy, occasionally has confidence issues. Started seeing that crack when I sent him the vid. Yeah, um, that's something that I hope many people picked up on with that video. Um, that I, I don't know if they particularly will, insofar as that there's been so many people that... Texas talked about complaining about how long it takes in between various things and the slower upload speed on uh, the core BPL web um, YouTube channel. But sometimes people just have a hard time with, well, various different things, including hobbies and passion projects. Even if the passion is there, sometimes the drive ain't and so on and so forth. But these projects are really personal to him. And I like the fact that he's kind of put those personal touches in there that... I hope people will kind of feel that, reach out and touch them, um, and not just, you know, take it at surface level and think that it's just some discussion about, oh, well, I just like the Warhammer, and I think that anybody that says otherwise just doesn't uh, doesn't like things that are okay, and they're all, you know, I, I can totally see some people taking it as, I've never seen anybody do this because I don't pay attention to, uh, I don't really have a pulse on the... Uh, community and whatnot but like i hope somebody doesn't take that as him saying like oh all you are just you know try hard meta people and so on and so forth and things that are okay are good enough from uh because they're not meta or something like that but um i thought it was really really well done and i thought it was very very well thought out and i loved the inclusion of that sort of a little bit of more personal touch It hit me at a good time for it, too, also. Yeah, I I don't have much of a chance to stretch my um, writing fingers these days, but I've always appreciated that sort of thing because it reminds me of... It reminds me of how I used to write back when I was in school and the projects that I used to do back then. And many of the people that I enjoy content from oft are on the same sort of level where it's like like another one of my favorite um, content creators on YouTube is Noah Caldwell Gervais, specifically because it's like every video that he does is basically like a master level thesis, practically, on uh, regardless of what the... Um, Regardless of what the subject matter is, it's just extremely well thought out and extremely well written. Exception, if the lecture is about a mech that is rushed in something of a shit box, I could accept that approach to the video's design in small doses to make an impact. Yeah, but that would be something that's actively uh, intended. Um, And therefore, would still like the the quality of craft would still come through. Yeah, I like Noah. Again, another person that I think is a little too hard on himself at times, but I don't think he can help that. There are very few people out there that by simply watching an analysis video can convince me to play a game that I have washed my hands at multiple times, but his stuff on like the Dark Souls series and some similar things in the past convinced me like wholeheartedly to do it, partially because it's great to see somebody like him who goes into it with a, uh, a much more like um, casual player's mindset to a lot of uh, similar games like that in StarCraft, but then shows you how you can still have fun enjoy it and get like a full amount of uh experience out of it even without having to master the game oh a little coffee hmm yeah i actually um i had been trying to get because i really wanted to get out of playing just 40k and 40k derivatives in my local community when I was first getting started with board gaming like 10 years ago. And uh, it was funny to me because I had been trying for probably like three years 
before Catalyst did this, um, before this whole Battletech Renaissance started and the new uh, starter sets and everything came out, and even after, um, even after the the sets came out, I still kind of had a hard time getting them, getting a handful of my friends interested in playing Battletech until Text Talks Battletech came across my desk. And I sent them the Text Talks Battletech videos, and the, whatever it was just clicked. And then all of a sudden, everybody slowly started to get more and more interested and ask more questions and kind of come around to the idea. And then I, you know, I can then pass them off to like, oh, by the way, if you'd like to get deeper into this, a great way to do that is the Hairbrain Schemes uh, game. And so on and so forth. And a lot of times they were like their interests in certain things would kind of coincide with the uh, with the Text Talks Battletech video coming out. So it was very, very cool to see that happen. Uh, to actually see like my community flourish once I finally found the key part to get them into it. But it's because of Noah that I'm going to one day wander the vegas area and never going to vegas itself i played fallout new vegas so much and him confirm it the map is pretty accurate just makes me want to hike again yeah no i totally feel that that uh, i have not i live in um actually my hometown is uh redding which you can visit in fallout 2 um and uh it is the most accurate depiction of my city i have ever seen on a metaphorical level not on a literal level which is hilarious because when Noah went there on his trip, uh, I believe his comment was, Reading is the most aggressively boring town I have ever been to. And yeah, that's, uh, yeah. But uh, it was interesting to see him go through all these places that I didn't really have too much of an interest in traveling to and exploring, just because, even though I'm already right here, purely because, for the most part, I have lived in this area for so long. Not, not the Redding area, but like just the California area, and I don't really agree with the heat and sun. So going all the way out into the desert, um, even into the High Plains desert, would be a little bit difficult for me until it... Maybe the High Plains would probably be okay because they get quite a bit cooler, but um, I would love to see some of those places now after having seen his videos and then kind of looking at some other travel log sort of things after that and getting interested in it. That's an It's an area that's on my list to look at. But no, I don't really care much for Vegas. I never did, even when I was playing jazz and um, going to Reno and Vegas for uh, competitions every year. That new Vindicator mini looks amazing. Yes, I absolutely agree with that. I'm not a huge Vindicator fan, but that's... Mm, I like it. I really do like it. Well, Grimos, Professor Randolph P. Checkers is an excellent teaching persona. That is a good point. Um, I appreciate the fact that it all comes from an in-universe sort of... Not exactly tongue in cheek, but just like almost like elbow ribbing uh, point of view, uh, where it's clearly it's a character who is giving you a lecture, but it's done in a very uh, very personable way. Um, and I have HBS BattleTech, but I can't run it on my laptop. Yep i I bought one of my partners um, the HBS BattleTech when she started expressing some interest in it at one point, and uh, same thing she. She was just kind of like, this seems like it'd be a really, really interesting game if I could run it on my computer. <laughs> it's not that taxing, but it's just taxing enough that if you're not running a modern computer, you will have some problems, unfortunately. Well, I mean, modern as of like the last four or five years. I think the secret ingredients for Texas stuff is the extra tones slash setting stuff he adds in his videos. I do agree with that. That is the huge part of it to me also is that he has gone the extra mile to bring uh, an actual sense of, um, not reality, but just like a sense that it's a universe where things happen and people live more than just, um, more than just being a history lecture. It's giving you a cultural lecture and everything as well and getting you into the vibe and uh, the vibe, the feel, and the sort of... Um, culture of Battletech players through the lens of an actual character in Battletech. Um, Lord Grimos, and it's beautiful to feel like I'm once again learning something that makes me feel such a passion. Also, yes, you def that as well. Yeah, 
No, I'm with you on that. Uh, Volcanic Abe, another one of Texas victims. Friends showed me the TTB videos, and that got me into HBS Battletech and then MechWarrior 5. Yep, beware the pipeline. <laughs> I want to run it, but I can't. It's like I want to put three ballistic weapons on a Shadowhawk because you can. The specs say so, but practically you really can't. Oh, God, I know that feeling. The inner sphere, the periphery, and the clan space is all alive, and its demonstration of that proves it is. Yes. Yeah, exactly. No, I think that that's, more than anything else, that's what he has done best, is he's kind of just given everything a place. Everything that he talks about, he gives sort of a place within the world, um, insofar as, like, he makes it feel like it fits in a living world, not simply just that it's an element to a setting, so on and so forth. Perfect example from that as well. I would not like the clans as much as I do if Tex didn't talk about the Star League first. Yeah. Um, no, I am very happy about the fact that he tackled the uh, Ameri Civil War and whatnot early on because it's one of those sort of things that, like, prior to him bringing it up, it was something that was kind of, like, known about but not really addressed. But I feel, like, for an analogy, the Ameri Civil War in the Star League era is kind of like the Warhammer 30K, the Horus Heresy, to uh, to modern 40K um so uh, it's one of those sort of things where same sort of thing games workshop did the same deal where it was like uh 30k was never actually a thing um previously aside from just like a historical footnote that was known to have set the stage for everything but it wasn't nearly as big a deal as it is now where it's like oh it's got dozens and dozens of books and now it's got tons and tons of uh games and rules and so on and so forth and it took someone sitting down and going let's make a novel series and actually write things out to flesh out everything as a as if it's a shakespearean tragedy as opposed to just having it be a historical footnote and suddenly there you go now people have a much better understanding of and appreciation for the modern elements or at least the pre-modern elements of 40k not 41k so on and so forth and i think that texas kind of done the same thing with the Ameri civil war videos where now you have um, now you have some perspective on where things are at now compared to how they used to be more so than just saying, well, things used to be better. And then we had wars, so on and so forth. Let me put this, uh, I want to get this mineral spirits off my desk so I don't accidentally drop it onto the candles real quick. <sighs> Sorry, I've been sitting there turned halfway around for a good, like three minutes, just waiting to waiting for me to stop talking before I jumped up and put that away so that I could then uh, sit down and start putting the uh, highlighting metallics on these guys to finish them up prior to... Um... Mm. Sorry, hydration. Prior to uh, eventually basing them. <sighs> so a lot of mill wall in the concordat. Oh! Yeah, I can do that. Uh, let's see, where did I put that Duraluminum? Actually, ah, God, I'm running so low on the Duraluminum. Mm, what do I want to use instead? No, I'll still use that. Like I said, Vallejo has been having some serious problems in the supply chain, or at least people in the United States have been having problems getting their hands on it, um, in the metal colors in particular. So I'm starting to run low on a handful of my most commonly used Vallejo metal colors. Okay, going from one paint water cup to another. I don't actually think I'm going to have anything on here, so I'm going to go... <clears throat> Gosh. That's how you know the paint's getting old. <laughs> you can barely pop the thing open. Okay, two drops out of do you? Mom's not that crazy, but up to that point, she's every part mill walls. 
Fair enough. It's one of those you do you boo boo sort of moments. Oh, that's the uh, wrong one. Let's see here. Ha. There's one and ha, there's two. Okay. And now the fun begins. Now that I've deadened down that overtly orange rust quite a bit, we are now moving on to the metallics. Ho 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 ho. Heavy metal. Heavy metal. <laughs> so on and so forth. Just get a little on there, wake a little off, and we start a going. All I'm doing with this is just adding highlights. Bringing some silver back into the areas where it would have been worn off and made to look all shiny and whatnot. Mostly, that's going to be the edges of weapons. Like the edges and the tip of the spear here. Predominantly in areas where it would still strike or be hit by other things. I usually put a little bit on the little tip of their helmet thing there. A little spike. Get all the little raised edges like these little spiky thingamabobs just so that they catch your eye. Let's make sure I've got that centered and in view. Just the tip. Just the tip. That's all we're asking for here. And then I'm going to go around the edges. Just kind of tap add lightly a little bit to the edges of the gauntlets. Or not gauntlets, sorry, bracers. Or whatever the hell these are. But also making sure to add some to the raised ridge as well. That goes all the way down the center. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take it all the way down the center, but just kind of add a little here and there. Okay, uh, boots. I'm not gonna worry about. I don't, well, I'll just add a little bit to the little. I'll just do the little cresty part on the top and on the that right there. Yeah. There we go. Actually, I kind of like the way that that we get just a little on the heel part too, just so it kind of kind of catches the eye a little bit. What else am I missing? Ah, the uh, this here and then the breastplate. Try to catch the edges of this little metal thing here. Don't need to redo it again. Um, no, I think it's LB number X. I'm not 100% sure, though. LB weapons are something I never really got too much into. I was never a huge fan of them in MechWarrior Online or in MechWarrior 5 when they come up. They are very effective, just not to my tastes. I almost always, when I'm playing, uh, when I'm playing MechWarrior online, I almost always wind up running um, light mechs, so I would never have anything that would mount an LB weapon. Just a bit to frame the face, and then a little bit on this rim going around here. Again, not a bit. This is kind of one of those less is more moments. I don't want giant patches of... Um, silver metallic on it. I just want little bits to kind of add a little bit of differentiation, draw the eye. There we go here. Certainly right there. Same thing on this side, except that's mostly gone because he's broken it off. Or it's rusted off, I don't know. And the center chest part. Come on, there we go. Sweet, okay. Now that I've got this brush is pretty much dried out and kind of flattened, I'm just going to 
take it and add a little bit of extra here and there just to represent places where it's been kind of oh I can't forget these just to represent places where it's kind of uh, patches where it's been scraped off a little bit scraped down past the finish and the rust Just a little here and there. Okay. You might not be the person to ask, but why don't Kleiners have rotary auto cannons? Um. When was the rotary auto cannon invented? That might have been something that wasn't invented until after the clan invasion. Let me see. I'm sure that I can just look it up really quickly. Yeah, so a rack five uh, is only available 3062 onward and there are clan ones there probably just aren't clan ones in whichever games you're playing yet oh yeah it looks like the rack five was um the rack five was developed in 3062 by the federated commonwealth so um Clanners didn't have them initially because they're an inner sphere. Uh, they're an inner sphere uh, invention that happened post clan invasion, um, but they do have apparently there are clan variants within the tabletop game at least. Oh right, need to leave him on there. Now the part we get to is painting the shield trim. This part always gets a little messy sometimes. And that's just hitting all I'm doing with this is like you can see that the trim's already been painted, but um, I painted over it when I did the rust streak stuff um, and then decided afterwards I didn't like that and wanted to have it. I want the silvers to actually look like they're not something that would rust, so they may tarnish, but they won't rust. So now I'm just going back over the dulled down uh, silvers just to bring it back up and make them shiny. Okay, there we go. I think that is good enough for one miniature. So that's pretty much it, I think. Let's get a little more here, though. I think that's pretty much all I wanted to do with these guys, as far as, um, like, I'd be happy to call this one quits and put him on a base. I'm not done right now, obviously. I'm going to uh, move on to other miniatures, but I think that's pretty all right there's nothing else i really want to address majorly these are just game pieces after all they're not display pieces and these are the second lowest importance pieces in that whole set so well i got i guess not the second lowest there's the rat swarms and things also but let me pop that down
Yeah, that's one of those sort of things. I so if you wanted an in lore reason as to why, um, if you wanted an in lore reason as to why they might not have done that, most clans that you hear talking about marksmanship at all, there's very few clans that ever were mentioned as liking Daka. There are many clans that were mentioned as having a hard on for marksmanship, and the clans had an extremely anti waste culture. Um, so I feel like that's something that like resources wise, they probably would have gone like, we can make this thing that fires like five times as fast, if not hot more fast. Um, or we can just teach our people to shoot good and hit it with one shot or something similar. Uh, that could be complete bullshit, but that's just like in my brain. If I, if I went like, oh, I've got to justify this somehow, I would just point to something like that. Same sort of thing where it's just like honor compels them to not fight in melee like come on man and same thing doesn't sell bring in or uh whatever the ruling also dictate like no you're not allowed to use you're not allowed to fire indirect weapons at your opponent you can only shoot at them directly because you have to see them and and face them so on and so forth so i can imagine there's probably some clause in there about uh the wastefulness of expending too much ammunition to get the same job done after all, in real-world circumstances, when you actually look at some of the um, the studies and statistics that were done during the Civil War, um, it was often found that even though the kill counts would be higher for regiments that were issued things like lever-action rifles, their ammunition expenditure was like disproportionately higher. Oh, I'm sure they probably do. And it's one of those sort of things, it's... Uh, just like in Mech Warrior 5 where you see the um like you got like the AC20 and then you got the AC20 burst fire there might have been variants like that out there already um but it's also one of those sort of things where it's like just because there's historical precedent for something that worked decently well doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to fit within every military doctrine um in the same way that you very rarely see like <laughs> I don't really have a, an analogy for this when I think about it in reality. Um, but uh, j mostly just because I don't really have... I, I could say something like, well, if you're were, if you were special ops or something like that and you're doing a black ops, you're not going to call it an a time warthog. But then I'm, I'm sure I would say that and somebody could absolutely, who has a much better grip on history than I do, would absolutely just go, actually, there were these three times and so on and so forth but it's one of those sort of things where it's just like you gotta whenever i get to the end of something i always just go well in the end it's just science fantasy a setting made for selling tabletop miniatures so eh, shrug there's a goofy reason why not and that's good enough for me to enjoy it yeah that's how they found it. The last A-10. <laughs> the A-10 was lost tech. There was just one museum piece sitting inside of a Brian Cash somewhere that the Fed sons stumbled upon. Yeah, I was actually just about to say the last A10 absolutely sounds like uh, something that would happen in fucking Knife Fight City. That kind of smacks of the. Uh, did you ever read the? God, these were, they were so smutty and they were so like teenagery. But uh, when I was like middle school, junior high, and up through high school, I used to love the Wingman novels by Mac Maloney. I think was the guy's name. Did you ever read those before? <laughs> the. Uh hawk hunter the pilot with fucking um uh the, the pilot that's got like esp for airplanes flying the last f-16 in the world so on and so forth they weren't great books they were absolutely schlocky but the basically it was just like the guy started writing them kind of as a for fun sort of thing and uh they sold at least enough to justify him writing like 20 something of the fuckers. It was crazy. It was extremely pulpy, way over the top, ridiculous, like adolescent fantasy level. Um, 
but they were kind of funny. <laughs> and as an adolescent uh, who was very into uh, you know 80s action movies and shit like that, I just ate that shit up. It was, uh, yeah, the core concept of it was basically just what if Mad Max but with airplanes instead of cars, which was not a bad um, premise whatsoever. Hmm. I don't know how they can do it. Rotary Goss. It's not that material expensive. The ammo is cheap by comparison. Theoretically, but I also don't know in, like, Goss is extremely expensive in um, Battletech, and I think the Goss rounds are also extremely expensive, but I think that the implication there is supposed to be that you're not just paying for the, like, the reason we don't have Goss rep weaponry and, um, uh, the reason we don't have Goss weaponry and similar things in real life as a standard thing is because, yes, we can do it, but it I think it, like, you basically blow out the capacitors every time. Um, or something similar, where it's just like, it's it's you have to replace a lot of parts, and there's some things that just really don't take to... Some parts of, like, the coils and the track and whatnot don't take to being fired very well. They just don't like to work, um, so they require a lot of very expensive replacement. I could see that being a thing with Goss and Battletech, potentially, that it's like it's not that the ammunition is expensive, it's just that like you get one mission and then you need a complete refit of the uh of the weapons capacitors and shit like that. Yeah, energy concerns also. Yeah, exactly. The trifecta of Airland Sea post apocalyptic alongside Mad Max and Waterworld. That's part of the reason why I really, really enjoyed uh Project Wingman when I finally got my hands on it. I was always a fan of the uh Ace Combat games here and there, and then I replayed all of them recently, and then right after that I was still hungering for more. Um, and I just stumbled across Project Wingman and I played it and it was just like, oh my god, it's like a gift from God for someone like me that had that sort of thing uh, that that sort of interest as a kid and also really likes the it's a really great homage to and some in some ways it surpasses ace combat mechanically not in all ways but many ways let's see knife fight city idea the quest for the last a10 in the world a movie that is based on the indiana jones the last crusade concept except instead of the holy grail it's the holy a10 yes <laughs> yeah no project wingman if you ever get the chance to grab it it is a boatload of fun um as many other people that you can see reviews of and so on have said it is extremely well made it's wonderful in vr it's i would say like in many respects, I preferred Project Wingman to Ace Combat 7 on like a design and mechanical level um, and an encounter level uh, for the most part. Um, and the music, holy shit, the music. Yes, please send that to them. That, uh, that definitely needs to go in there somewhere. Yes, uh, no, I totally do get that, Mazke. But it's just one of those sort of things where, like, eh, I can totally see that being, if you ask the devs why it's not a thing or if they're going to make it a thing, that would be something I could totally see them just shrugging and going, like, eh, it doesn't because of this. So, maybe, maybe not. I'm just going to paint these pommels silver. Just fuck it, you don't need gold. You don't need gold handles. Ah, fucking orange. I see that you've seen the uh, review videos. The first patch that came out for uh, Project Wingman, actually, or maybe like the second or third, uh, reduced the amount of orange. It's still there, still very orange, but not nearly like it was at launch. I personally didn't have a problem with it. I played it like the week after that patch went out. I like some of the Ace Combat uh, 7 music, but the... 
the big thing to me is just nothing in the Ace Combat 7 soundtrack holds a candle to the track called Showdown, uh, which is the one that plays during the uh, the mission over the... What was the Baltic Sea? No, it was uh, the mission over the Bering, Bering Strait. <laughs> Mission's fucking... Um, that mission is fucking ridiculous. They sent a they sent a bunch of their transports up to take a bunch of troops back. So we sent up a flight to intercept it. So they sent up a flight to intercept our flight. So we sent up a flight to intercept the flight intercepting our flight. And they sent another flight up. So we sent another flight up. And now we're out of fighters. <laughs> and that's where you come in. Have you ever given a skeleton a golden arm just for shits and giggles? No, but I have... Uh... I don't know if I have them here or not, but I occasionally in some of my um, uh, some of my more heavy metal uh, fantasy stuff, I have given some of them chrome skulls and like Terminator looking heads. Um, uh, yeah, and I also, for what it's worth, also as far as the orange goes, depends on how long you actually spent on it. Um, if you had a hard time getting through the last couple of missions yes you are going to suffer through a lot of orange if you get through the last couple of missions um without too many tries then it's like 20 minutes of orange uh before the final boss fight um Yeah, like I said, I don't actually know where to send things for the Knife Fight City thing, but I assume that there is probably somewhere. And yes, you are correct, uh, Opiomorphous. That is the furball. Yeah, the one where you get up there and you're, you the mission starts, the disco music kicks in, and all you see is just missile trails blossoming in front of you as, the, <laughs> as all of your buddies that are already up there are duking it out with, the, with all of the... Uh, federation forces that came up to intercept them and the transports are still flying and you can totally take them out if you want to have a good time with the uh with that one particular mission by the way the showdown over the bearing Strait, um Play it on mercenary mode so you get shitloads more, uh, way more difficult enemies and just like tons more than you get in normal mode. And before you do it, turn on the double time modifier that doubles the number of enemies that spawn. <laughs> But yeah, the true beauty of that game is uh, you can kind of get the same sort of thing in Ace Combat 7, but if you know what you're doing and what to expect, like people that play it for long enough realize that it's not it's not a wonderful arcade game. Uh, it's, it's not just like a wonderful arcade sim, uh, flight sim. It's also like it's the best Robotech game that has ever been released, essentially. Or, or more Macross, I suppose. The best Macross game that has ever been released. If you play it correctly on Mercenary mode, with the uh, especially the super planes that you get after you beat it once. Oh. Oh, yeah. Welcome back, Diggs. Oh, you're approaching me? Uh... Let's see. Diggs is always the chosen one. Um, Diggs, do you have any idea where people can send suggestions to the mods for the Knife Fight City wiki? They were talking about that earlier on. Someone had a wonderful idea for a Knife Fight City movie concept. Got a little hair in there. Um...
more there, a little more there, and this one right here, just the edges of it. Okay, now it's probably good. Moving on. <laughs> okay, that's fair, Diggs. A septagon bullet. Well, hello there. Hello there. Now that you say it, I'm curious how long it'll be before we wind up crowdfunding an actual Knife Fight City, uh, an actual Knife Fight City <laughs> movie. Because I do feel like that is the uh, logical end result, even if that's not truly the end goal. That's the end game. Oh yeah, no, I love those shirts. Eldonius Rex's shirts just like across the board are phenomenal designs and the shirts that they actually come on are pretty damn good whoops that's a bit much yeah it's fine just weathering just doing nice silver spots after old man henderson gets this movie yeah I would actually love to see the old man Henderson story as a, uh, um, as like a, uh, an indie film, indie horror Lovecraftian. Oh, by the way, everybody, don't forget to wish Diggs a happy birthday. Can't forget that. Okay, that's the shield. There's no helmet on this guy, so let me pick out all these rivets. I feel like I can see chat moving in my peripheral, but I haven't had a chance to look down on it. Give me one second. Okay. Oh, what did I miss? Let's see. Just make Crow and Goat the main actors, text the narrator, and get a bunch of animation stuff done by Rex Kung Fury. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, everything with the BPL is going to be a comedy, whether or not it's actually a comedy where it's like real it's secretly a comedy just kind of like played straight praise zorg praise zorg what does it do here what do you mean by here like in the twitch channel Oh, is there like an option in Twitch to trigger a DFA? That might be something that's like specific when they're doing the uh, um, the Battletech uh, streams. Like you can, is that something you can redeem? If it is, maybe you can redeem that and force them to do a DFA on the next action. I would assume so. 
Diggs, do you know what the uh, DFA is? The DFA thing uh, as the redeemable in Twitch just something? Okay, yeah. So yeah, you can just uh, if you see a BattleTech stream pop up uh, on here, you can or MechWarrior, yeah, redeem it, and I guess that will just force them to DFA as their next action. You're going to make a skeleton with a solid gold arm for D&D that just wants to sell, but keeps getting kicked out of villages because he's a skeleton. Is his arm that he's actually using gold, or is it just another arm from another skeleton he's carrying around with all of his normal arms? Uh, so Mech Warrior Five Death from Above is a thing. I don't know if it is something by default that's a thing, but almost all of the mod packs that um the BPL plays with that I see them do normally have uh, Death from Above is a thing. If you jump jet and land on top of another mech, it does do shitloads of damage to them. Um. His current usable arms are one man out of bone, one man out of solid gold. Yeah, you know what you need to do with that guy, Orc Slayer, with the uh, one golden arm skeleton trying to sell it? Did you ever watch uh, Avatar The Last Airbender? <laughs> you uh, you remember the cabbage seller? You got to do that with that guy. Just like every time the PCs show up in a new uh, village somewhere or w town or city or whatever, he's just there. And all you see is just like another little vignette of him just getting told to get, you know, either told to get the fuck out or just otherwise getting fucked with somehow. I don't know exactly what the translation of my cabbage is, is into uh, skeleton rattle, but, uh, you know, creative liberties and all that. Hmm. Let's see, yeah, that's right. I got this right here with the ribs. Okay. Is that good? We good on this one? I think so. Yeah, I don't know if they... I can't remember if they ever attempted um, to implement DFA in uh, MechWarrior Online. I do remember I was in the closed beta um, quite a while ago, and I do remember uh, there was a point where they were experimenting with pseudo-melee, where there was knockdown, and it was funny as hell because there was a... Um, they used a some sort of mass and velocity calculation to determine if when you make contact with another mech one of you would potentially get knocked down and it would typically result in like small mechs would run into large mechs and they would get knocked over but there were ways that <laughs> during the beta you could uh break it and you could break the the beta pretty easily with regards to if they took the constraints off of certain elements and let you go hog wild with uh no you know, pricing didn't really matter, but the tonnage did. I remember taking a commando and putting the largest engine I possibly could into it at the tonnage it was at and taking off all but like all but a medium laser, I think. And I wound up going uh, very fast. I don't remember exactly how fast, but it was fast enough that with their little weird velocity mass calculation that they had in, I would just come around a corner and barrel straight and just clothesline an atlas. <laughs> and it, the animation they had for you getting back up was like um it, the it took a good like 
four or five seconds. So I and my dinky little commando would just fly out of nowhere and slam into someone's Atlas or other assault mech. And then my teammates would just walk over and just pop them in the back. <laughs> and, and then they'd just, whoop, yep, yeah, you're gone. Sorry. But let's see. Does the Phoenix Hawk jump jet lean forward for more horizontal thrust? I don't know about that specifically, but I do know that in the, um, in at, at least I think in the mods, possibly not in the standard version of MechWarrior 5, uh, one of the mods at least made it to that uh, is commonly in the BPL pack made um, made it so that your jump jetting is much more horizontal, particularly like at the beginning of your jump. So if you pulse your jump jet and you just go like on off on off on off, um, it would basically just propels you forward at like 200 kilometers per hour. Um, but if you hold it, then you will go forward, but then kind of like curve up a little bit more. If they put melee weapons in the mech war online, it would be the glorious end of so many matters. Yes, yes it would. <laughs> I'm going to have him constantly try and rip the gold limb off and give it to so many random people. And if no one takes his arm, then just sulk and attach it back on. Yeah. That's not a bad idea. MWO had stability knockdowns and beta, if I remember right, and an 8v8, but now it's just a clusterfuck. Yep. Her mechs could indeed headbutt bigger mechs in the crotch. Uh... Oh, man, another achievement. MWO. Salute. Yeah, salute to you as well. I had a handful of friends that got in with me, but not too many of them. And I didn't play a ton at the time because I was still in high school. So I didn't have that much time to uh, fuck around with it, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. If they still had that implemented, it would just be a clusterfuck. Now I just need someone to let me play as an undead within my uh, in D and D with my groups. Long, uh, you can always try to do some sort of. Uh, I don't actually have much of a grip on that, but through necromancy, you might have the ability to do that. Uh, not like play as him, but have uh, like a companion or something similar. <laughs> yeah, you know, take a couple of levels and whatever would grant you some abilities in necromancy, and then take a couple of levels in like ranger or druid until you get your animal companion and then just request that your animal companion just be a skeleton <laughs> hmm. okay carrying on we have another one of the sword dudes i think i will hydrate really quick like warrior online 12v12 is not mech combat it's just a slug out that nobody wants to peek yeah it's uh I have a hard time with playing any um, exclusively uh, competitive PvP games once the community gets to the point where um, practically the only players left are people that uh, are like extreme map awareness, extreme meta awareness, and so on and so forth. Uh, it kind of just, I don't like that it makes it difficult to get back into it after a while. Oh, wait, I already did this guy. Whoops. Um. But yeah, it's like if you haven't played in a while, sometimes that just makes it that much harder to get back into it. Because every time you go into it, I'm just trying to relearn where the maps are. And I'm just being given the runaround by everybody who's got a better grip on it than I do. Um, and there's kind of an expected level of you should kind of know where to go and where to be with your team. And you will get that after a while. But it makes it difficult at times, especially considering the fact that they keep on, um, I guess, wouldn't be so bad if all the maps were the same. But every time that I, you know, take a break for a year or something like that and come back and try it, they've changed all the goddamn maps. Like, not just made minor tweaks to them. In some cases, like, there were, there was one point where I came back and it's like, this map is twice as big as I remember it being. And there's a lot more shit in it. Or this map completely has different buildings in different areas. I don't know where I'm supposed to be going. Yeah. 
The thing about McCoy and Linus, if you convince your team to go all go left, it's wondrous chaos. Oh my god, you are correct. That was the big thing that, like, when I stopped playing for a while and came back to it after a bit, I couldn't believe that that was, like, NASCARing was such a thing that it was just the expected standard that both teams just immediately knew to start going right as soon as the game started just because they knew that the other team was going to be going right and then you would just circle and circle and circle and that was the game. I missed the the beta days and the the post beta like early release days where there was some not necessarily some measure of uncertainty but like people more so at that time were doing a whole lot more of like lights would split off and go scouting and try to call out where people were at um and actually like sit there and do things for the missile boats because they were useful at that time and there weren't um you know before you had the deal of like the what's the current thing you can get a fucking um corsair with some stupid like five anti-missile systems on it so it's just an umbrella that protects the team from any and all missiles that come nearby so on and so forth so there's a lot of uh there's still obviously roles but there's no more like stealth and sneaking and kind of checking things out or objective play for the most part. There's not a whole lot in the way of like um, innovation in tactics. It's mostly just attempting to be hyper efficient in the uh, in the usage of yourself. Oh yeah, thank you for putting that lurk thing in there, uh, Orc Slayers. Oops. Nice. And hopefully Parallax sees that and pops it up somewhere, Grimos. I know that Parallax already goes through them and does a pretty decent job of just kind of showing them off to the community. If I got into, if I figured out how to do that for myself also, is there anything in particular that you guys would actually like me to do with the uh, pictures in so far as like, um, you know, examining them and so on and so forth, aside from just looking at them and going like, hey, take a look at this. Oh, and thank you for popping up the Discord as well, Grimos. Yeah. If you guys haven't seen it before, the BPL now has an auxiliary Discord that you can join and become part of the the uh, Legion Auxiliary. It is free and open to all. Check that link in the chat and whatnot. And you can go hang out. Tex occasionally pops in there with a handful of other members of the BPL and does some streaming as well. There's a handful of BPL members and WBPL staff that kind of hang out on occasion. I haven't done a whole lot in there just because I haven't been done a whole lot in general. How fast would they be going if you painted them? Cra yeah, they would be going ludicrous speed. But is ludicrous speed faster than the speed you would get by painting them red? Because red paint makes them go faster, but it does not specifically say how fast is faster. Is it just faster than whatever the closest fast is well i hope digs didn't scare you i know that sometimes coming up on a bear when you didn't expect one is a little bit uh it can be a little bit disconcerting a little surprising Don't worry, Diggs is usually 
pretty gentle as long as you give them some nice treats and wish them a happy birthday just make sure again keep your brushes away from them mm -mm. never again Red also gets you pulled over by the Irby cop yes I think if you had a submission section that I advise maybe giving a, advice it's what pair does as well but with the many mentors always create fascinating students he didn't scare you and yes a surprise bear is gonna be surprising one even gave me a sword and yee he's a good bear Casador scare me bears do not yeah Oh, God, yeah. No, tarantula wasps or tarantula hawks, whatever the hell they're called. Fuckers. I don't like them. I am thankful that I do not live in an area that currently has them. I already kind of have a phobia of bees and wasps and related things. So they freak me the fuck out when I play New Vegas. But it does offer a bit of odd catharsis when you get to the point where you're you know, running around rocking the anti-material rifle or something like that just to be able to go, hole up, boys, and then just fucking <laughs> murk them from half a mile away. Ooh. Uh, flying insects and spiders give me the jubilees. I have nightmares about hornets. Yeah, same here. Candles cold does wonders for making insects less of a problem. I've always wanted a Fallout game in downtown Toronto. Ooh. Yeah, no, I wish the Fallout games would kind of get to a little bit of a... Uh, if they're going to insist on not going back to the... Um, they're going to insist on not going back to the original setting for all of the Bethesda ones. I would I would hope that they're going to, over time, explore more unique settings uh, for it and not just keep on doing the same. We're going back to New England again. My personal pick has always been, um, like, when my, one of my former DMs uh, was running a Fallout game, I gave him the idea and he ran with it, and I loved it, of... Uh, basing it in Colorado because uh it, you know at that time we were just ignoring the fact that technically the legion is supposed to own Colorado and certain timelines or whatever um but if you go to Colorado you got the old NORAD uh base there which picture NORAD and then picture NORAD in the Fallout universe um and then just say what we did was we just said that like oh you're all here in this area because recently someone found a way into the new NORAD facility, uh, a new entrance to it, and now it's like a gold rush where everybody is uh, coming to the area hoping to go down and prospect inside the ruins of this sprawling NORAD uh, facility for various different things. And so there's like boom towns popping up all over the exterior area, and you're actually in Colorado. So you've got to deal with Colorado weather and Colorado considerations aside from just the climate but it was a nice little break from uh the constant urban new uh urban new england versus uh practically just barren desert wastes of the west let's see Earlier this evening, I had to kill four horse flies in under a minute. It was not fun. Yeah, I don't doubt you. I like some spiders, though. Jumping spiders are just curious. No intent to harm. They just want a high vantage point to pounce on bugs. Yeah, I, it's uh, one of my... Oh, hey, look at that. Posture check and stretch. Can I... Uh, I don't know if I'd be able to get a good pop for you. Let's see. Oh. And two. Ah. Oh. Maybe the neck. You might be able to hear that. Oh. Uh, oh, there we go. Oh, fuck. 
Oh, thank you. I needed that. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was probably my neck. Uh, yeah, no, my uh, one of my partners is deathly afraid of uh, most spiders in general. Um, not really deathly afraid. She just hates them like awful. She loves killing black widows because she just fucking hates them. But uh, we've kind of like we've made the uh, the distinction between the two of us between spiders and spooters and so uh <laughs> i'm sorry i i promise you that's not what it sounds like when i orgasm <laughs> um but yeah it's just like jumping spiders you look at it and it's just like oh it's just a little jumping dude that's a spooter uh but then you see a black widow or um black widow or brown recluse or something like that and you're just like oh you fucking spider get out of here um, but thankfully we have spray for that. When I'm around, a significant percentage of all questions are dumb questions, and the statement, there are no dumb questions, is met with, give me five minutes. Well, fair. Yeah, I didn't, uh, mosquito hawks kind of freaked me out when I was, uh, younger for all of, like, 20 minutes until my mom explained like no 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 no, it's a mosquito hawk all it does is eat mosquitoes i thought it was a giant mosquito and so i was just kind of like oh my god how much blood is that thing gonna suck and uh it did not suck any blood at least not any of mine yeah fallout norad i just always thought that was a really neat idea and like i said like going to colorado is enough of a climate and culture change that i really think that there's some fertile ground there for the fallout universe Jumpers are cute. They tilt their little head at you like, are you going to give me a lift? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's pretty much a perfect rule or broken, at least for me. Um, I actually had to do that recently where there was a... Uh, I was fucking around the garage, didn't have any spray or anything like that, and didn't have anything to hand um, to kill it with, but I freaked out for a second when I had a propane torch in my... Uh, in one hand and I was about to reach for the doorknob and there was a widow on the uh, light switch right next to the doorknob and when I uh, when I put my hand there it started moving and so I pulled my hand back really quick but it jumped onto the toolbox and so I just lit that fucker up <laughs> and it was just like oh yeah praise Zorg send all of the spiders to Zorg that you come across not the spooters only the spiders Okay, let's see here. What else do I need to do on you? You done? I think you're close to me. Ah, there's one spot that I forgot to pull all of the uh, rust off of. Just this little band here. That's fine. It doesn't need to be that rusty. And I'm seeing some undertone here, so let's just go a little over that as well. Okay. Uh, I think he's good enough. Well, actually, let me get... That's a bit much on the uh, shiny there, but that'll be fine. I'm probably going to cover them in some sort of paste or pigment powder anyways when I get around to uh, basing them. Okay. Um, that all looks good on the shield. Okay. I'll check this guy's shield because I don't think I painted the whole thing on here. I did not. So let me just. Uh... There we go. Easy fix. Rustov? I don't know what that is. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> kind of just came up. Uh, 
Cornell Roostov, you must send our rust monster hunting packs forth and destroy the invading golems. I do not understand this reference. We get wolf spiders and jumpers here. The wolf spiders only look spooky, but our friends in disguise. I thought they were supposed to be decently uh, venomous, but are they just ven like are they venomous but won't fuck with you if you don't fuck with them sort of thing? They leave people only and all the bugs. Yeah. That works. Do they eat other spiders also? I've heard that Daddy Longlegs will actually hunt and uh not really a hunt, but will kill black widows if they uh encroach too far. So I'm always happy to leave some around. Think of a mechanical scorpion, twice the size of regular, that burrows into your body, takes it over nervous system and all, subverts your flesh to make weapons from your arms, and over time your body decays like it's made of metal and oxidizes. Sometimes you'll get passed off from parasite to parasite as they hand you down while your body uh, rots and rusts. Interesting. What is that from? Is that from a game, or is that from a movie? They used to live in Washington State, and the sole reason our house didn't have hundreds of rats in it was due to our black lab. They loved just wheezing his way into the crawl space and going to Duma. That's, that's great. <laughs> Although, on one hand, that is awful, because I'm sure that that puts you at high risk for uh, potentially getting sick by eating one that was gone bad or something like that. But, hey, that's that's an animal doing an honest job for an honest living, you know? Let's see. I haven't seen the ones out here eat other spiders, but I always find a ton of bug corpses after I spot a wolf spider. Eh. Sounds like some 40k Catachan stuff. An astonishing number of its flora and fauna are parasitic. Yeah. That's part of the reason why the Catachans love their flamethrowers. It's not just a Vietnam reference. That is very much just a standard part of the cat of the, uh, daily catachan routine you get up you shit shower shave eat a little bit of food and grab your flamethrower and go clear the forest back for about a mile because if you don't it'll overgrow you within a couple days
Almost done here. Ah, shin guard. That's right. Get that on there. Little dot on each one of these rivets. And there, and there, and there, good. Rivets right here. Okay. Check the chat. What makes some so many things of all parasitic traits? I uh, when in doubt, just blame it on chaos. Remember when I was seven or eight, I was on a little hiking expedition with my year group. We came across this big old garden snake, garden snake that is, and it was just vibing while eating a rat. We just observed. Ever since, I've had a healthy respect and fear of snakes because Jesus, those jaws. Yeah, no, that's uh, something I learned from uh, one of my friends. Uh, was in the army and he inherited a snake from one of his uh buddies that went AWOL eventually I think um who had bought the snake from a stripper that kept it inside of her suitcase so it stunted its growth but it is still very much uh it's a big snake it's some sort of um I think it's some sort of python or something like that but uh they've got it in a big ass glass case next to their bed and my god what a creepy thing that must be because they described it that like Every time that you see a snake doing the thing where it looks all friendly, where it's rubbing up against the side of the glass and trying to get close to you, it uh, that is typically it trying to size up whether or not it can fit you into its stomach if it wanted to. <laughs> so the uh, their snake, they make absolutely sure that they... Uh, that whenever it gets hungry, they feed it ASAP and make sure that it's sealed very much inside of its uh, cage whenever they, uh, not cage, but uh, whatever, the enclosure, whenever they think that it's going to start getting hungry. <sighs> Terrarium. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I want to say it's a ball python, but I could be completely wrong. Yeah, it's some sort of tank, but I figured there was some more specific term for it that was more correct. I mean, it is basically just a tank with specialty lid.
Okay. I think this one's probably good. Oh, let me get a little there. It's a bit much, but oh well. Oh, right, the chest. There we go. Okay. What did I miss in the chat? I painted a full lance. Full battalion of advanced ant militia. Oh, yeah. Good night, Diggs. Uh, yeah, I do agree. I Now that I've been getting a little bit tired, I'm starting to kind of... Uh, uh starting to kind of fade a little bit so i'm not talking as much i made some playlists on epidemic sound but i just forgot to pop them on this time around um i'll just make sure i make a note to do that next time paid a full battalion of van zandt i just have to clean my coffee table so i can line them up for a photo shoot to send into the email Ooh, that's awesome a broken gamer I used to run across in a one case over turtles when i was in minnesota for a couple of years lots of box turtles and a couple snappers i gave those a wide berth yeah i don't blame you um, they get snappers on the road all the time. Need to bring a wooden broom to coax them off the road. Oh. Don't think we actually have really many turtles, if any, in my area that are native. Interesting thought, though. I wonder. Whew. Well, I meant to go to 11 o'clock tonight, my time, and it's 10.48, but I don't think I'm going to be able to continue doing so because I am starting to crash a little bit faster than I expected, and I don't want to down the rest of that coffee because that would just keep me up all night long, and I do have to work tomorrow. So, I think now's about as good a time as any. I am going to call it for the evening. I got most of these guys in a fair place, so I will... Uh, Potentially continue with more of the uh, skeletons next time that I stream, but if not, I've got plenty of other options as you've seen in the past. So, if you guys have any feedback, if there's anything that you think I could have done better or that you'd like to see me do in the future, just let me know and I'll make a note of it. But for the time being, you guys have a good rest of your evening and I will see you all next time. stay safe and make it home safe if you're all if you're not out at the moment and if you are at home well have a good night enjoy your sleep <laughs> i'll see you all next time